Welcome to a roundtable discussion on contemporary management of esophageal cancer, particularly focusing on surgical aspects. In this segment, we'll be talking about surgical techniques and approaches. We have a number of international experts here. I'll ask them to introduce themselves, please. Hi, Steve DeMeester from Portland, Oregon. Magnus Nilsson from the Kelly's Institute, Stockholm, Sweden. I'm Mark Ferguson from the University of Chicago. Gail Darling, University of Toronto, Canada. I'm Jan van Lanschot from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So let me begin this by uh, throwing this open to the group as to what their preferred approach for the patients undergone induction or neoadjuvant therapy is. Uh, open or minimally invasive? Well, we do almost only minimal invasive nowadays as the primary surgery for normal patients. And uh, no, we, we, we feel that there are advantages. And there are also three trials now completed, of, of which one has been published in 2012, and the second one has actually just recently been accepted, showing uh, short-term advantages in terms of less morbidity and also quicker functional recovery, quicker recovery of uh, quality of life. Who else? Uh, we do almost exclusively minimally invasively laparoscopic and thoracoscopic uh, resections, regardless of whether they've had induction or neoadjuvant chemo radiation. We t tend to combine, so laparoscopy and open chest, open esophagectomy with an interest in thoracic anastomosis. But we, we, we do it all. Sometimes we do a transhiatal resection if the patient is frail. Sometimes we do a uh, uh, many totally minimally invasive, uh, but the advantages that have been shown for uh, laparoscopy or minimally invasive versus open has never been uh, shown, I think, for the hybrid procedure. So um, that's why we, I think 80% or so is operated in a hybrid way. This is the publication that's coming now, actually, the hybrid versus open, showing these advantages, the, the French Miro trial. Yeah, has been accepted recently. Yeah. But does not prove that? Open. Uh, the, the, the thoracic part is open, so it's a, it's a laparoscopic mobilization and lymph node dissection and then open chest, which simplifies the I, I, I think that the VATS part is very important because, you know, the, the transhyal esophagectomy, the whole advantage was avoiding that thoracotomy. And so to me, Avoiding the thoracotomy is the big advantage of the VATS approach to the, the chest part of the operation. And so laparoscopic, thoracoscopic, I think, is... is Interesting. Yeah. In our institutional data, we found that the patients who had hybrid um, VATS open abdomen compared to laparoscopic open chest, it's the, lapar it's the laparotomy. Really? It was the bad actor. All the diaphragm dysfunction, I think, contributes to a lot of pulmonary problems. You know, I think that if you really look at it, if you look at a patient that has an open coli or an open nissen compared to lap coli, lap nissen, these are two different worlds. If you look at the patient as an esophagectomy, whether it's minimally invasive or open, that difference is not as far apart. So while I think minimally invasive is a very reasonable way, and I prefer that for the most part, I don't think that the difference is so huge between open and minimally invasive that that's the big issue. The one thing I will say is I've always had trouble with the concept of the Ivor Lewis open. I like the minimally invasive Ivor Lewis because you're not restricted by your thoracotomy in terms of your choice. With the open Ivor Lewis, you either make a high thoracotomy, allows you to do a comfortable anastomosis, but compromises your lymph node dissection which in an adenocarcinoma distally is critical down low, or you make a low thoracotomy where you have beautiful access for lymph node dissection and struggle with anastomosis. Minimally invasively, you can do the Ivor Lewis and accomplish both very easily. So I'm not a proponent of the open Ivor Lewis, but I think the minimally invasive is a very reasonable approach. So a little bit of a mix, huh? A bit of a reflection. Miro show that hybrid is better than all open. Yeah. But it has not been shown that hybrid, that 
completely manually invasive is better than hybrid. Definitely not. So that's why I think it's it's still on the go. Right. Um, but clearly, to combine thoracotomy, open thoracotomy, and open laparotomy is a bad combination. Yeah. And that's why transiatal resections, in my view, are will favor because you prevent the combination of thoracotomy and laparotomy. Uh, yeah. And I think thoracotomy without laparotomy or laparotomy without thoracotomy yeah. is, is a big difference. That's yeah. where the big difference is. Yeah. That's and the and in clinical re- fear. And in really frail patients, we've been doing laparoscopic transiatal with, with, a, with a transiatal laparoscopic dissection uh-huh. and cervical anastomosis. And of course, this needs to be tested in trials too, but I think it's it's a promising type of surgery for very frail patients. Yeah. I, I'm not a fan of the uh, cervical anastomosis. Um, I think I put my anastomosis very high in the chest, like very high in the chest, so endoscopically there's not really much difference, but the leak rate is definitely lower, yeah. mm-hmm. um, and so I, I try to avoid the neck anastomosis as, as much as possible, yeah. unless it's required for, for the yeah. oncologic. Yeah. Yeah. We just finished a randomized trial in the Netherlands, the group in, in Nijmegen, but it was a multi-center Dutch trial, comparing cervical anastomosis and chest anastomosis. So we, well, and it's not finished yet, but we are, well, in a year, mm-hmm. we are two-thirds or so. So the, we will have the, the formal randomized trial yeah. with the MDs too. Yeah. Yeah, interesting question, but I, my feeling is that you are right. And most of the observational data support that yeah. there are more leaks, yeah. Yeah. but we need the trial. Would everybody agree that one size does not fit all and that we need to be able to tailor the operation to the individual patient's needs as opposed to everybody gets transital subjectomy, for example? Reasonable. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah, definitely. So the group has to have the experience to do it all. And that's why centralization is so important. You right. have to be able to have the volume to be able to switch from A to B to C yeah. and have experience with all. Because otherwise you will have one fits all, which is probably less favorable. Definitely. I think you're right. So we have some indication that minimally invasive approaches may be beneficial. What about robotic minimally invasive? Does the robot add anything to this operation? Well, it's very, very comfortable for the surgeon, and of course, it adds, uh, you know, dexterity. So I think there are theoretical, very clear advantages. But so far, the data that we've seen has not really differed at all from conventional minimal invasive. The third trial uh, comparing open to minimal invasive is the robot trial. A single center trial from Utrecht uh, comparing robotic minimal invasive to to open and it basically shows the same results as conventional minimal invasive compared to open but I think in the future with n- new robotic concepts with more versatile lighter robots maybe robotic surgery something we can use for parts of operations or you know as something that we did, that we add when we need it well, people are starting to report on uniportal, you know, tr- the thoracic portion, and that yeah. may be a clear advantage, right. reducing the number of ports. But I think the robotic technology needs another generation or two to be clearly differentiated from standard minimally invasive yeah. surgical yeah, approaches. Yeah, looked at around the world, the, the, the Korean trials looking at gastrectomies, robotic versus microscopic, multiple studies with benign and malignant disease around the world. Failed to show a clear advantage for the robot in most applications, perhaps in prostate, but in most applications, there's not been a clear benefit to the robot. I don't think it is a hindrance, but it's not a clear benefit. So it's but, nice for the surgeon, but it's, yeah. that's the only point. And it is pretty expensive. So yeah. the question is, I think, is it worth the investment? Because we have to be budget wise. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that it is cost effective. No. At this point in time, I don't think so, no. and I, I, we don't, I don't use it. I, it seemed like it was too expensive to justify, given the lack of perceived benefit. Yeah. So for an institution, 
the costs uh, can be justified by increased volume advertising, but from a societal standpoint, I don't think that there's any way you can justify the increased costs at this point. In no, time. no. But it's very important that we, as a surgical global group, we are going on and trying to, to get it further. So yeah. it's, it's fantastic that some groups are focusing on developing this robotic surgery. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come. You know, I'm sure you all remember the days of the initial VATS procedures, and you think, oh, I can do this open so much, you know, like, why am I doing this? I'm sure the robot will come, too. I'm, I'm also convinced with new generations of robots with artificial intelligence uh, parts, and, you know, we're going to have great improvements, I think, but it's in the future. All right, let's talk about minimally invasive, the thoracic portion, lateral position, prone position. Anybody have experience with both of those? I've done both. Uh, depends what your goal for the operation is. If you're going to do an on block and take out the azagus, take out all the intercostal veins and the thoracic duct, prone is difficult because you're seeing the azagus and intercostal veins on FOSS. In the lateral position, it's very nice because azagus intercostal veins are going like this, and you can go up with your energy and divide all of that. If you're not doing the on block and you're going to divide everything below the azagus and let it drop, then the prone has some nice advantages because you just you know, incise right along the azagus, everything drops, and, and your operation is pretty straightforward. So that's the technical aspects. What about uh, for recovery and complications? a lot more setup in the prone position. And if you had to convert, it's more difficult. But conversions are relatively rare. And what about your anesthesiologist's peace of mind? Uh, I think they prefer my one. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't really agree. <laughs> I, 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 I prefer prone. I try left lateral. I think the the working ergonomy is very good in prone, and we don't need double lumen intubation. So we have all our patients in single lumen, and we don't have any problems with the lung. We use uh, low pressure insufflation of eight millimeters of mercury, and lung is never a problem. And uh, sometimes the spine is in the way, as you imply. In some patients, we don't routinely take out the, the atzigus vein, but we always take the, the thoracic duct, and that's never a problem. So we can clear the aorta, and uh, working in the prone, you can work very well towards the, the, the hiatus area, and you can work towards the upper mediastinum and very comfortably, and we do upper mediastinal lymph node dissections if we need it, and it works very well. And the Japanese usually use semi-prone, which is very similar to prone. They never use left lateral for upper mediastinal. But I think one of the main advantages is the, the, the single, the, the ventilating both lungs. Yeah. So one of the original reported advantages was that you don't have to worry about the blood collecting in your field. Yeah. But, I mean, if you're a reasonably good minimally invasive surgery, you shouldn't have any blood. No. Sometimes you have some fluid coming up from the abdomen. That might be something, but uh, that's true. And do you frequently take out the uh, acetos vein? Most of the time. Not always. It depends a little bit on the patient and the indications and so forth. But my preference is to take out. We do it now in only in big tumors, big distal tumors. And, and I used to do it for decades, but uh, we stopped doing it. It's less work, it's more simple, more straightforward. And rather kind of, but we take out the azagus. The thoracic thoracic duct. Duct. I, I don't routinely take out the azagus, mm -hmm. but just the thoracic duct. And, um, but I want to try prone. Yeah. But our anesthesiologists have been like, I think, I mean, it's a little bit uncomfortable working with a patient lying on their belly. You have this, the, the head to the side. We always do endoscopies to check the anastomosis at the end of the procedure, and it's an art to be able to find the mouth in a good way and come down. Right. But, but we manage, and, and the anesthesiologists are nowadays very happy. Sometimes the patient needs a little bit of, of more ventilation because we turn off the, the peep. And, and so we have to take a break for them if in a frail patient to ventilate for a minute or two to get the oxygen saturation up. But normally, n not a problem at all. And how frequently does your endoscopy have any consequences? Well, uh, 
couple of times over the years, but very, very, very rarely. I mean, sometimes we we do a, a, a state linear staple side to side, and we close the remaining op opening with a running stitch. Sometimes we put another stitch. We see it's a little bit, you know, bluish in some area, but. You've never done it, but it's no. an interesting concept. I, I well, we started use it at the end because uh, we can evaluate the anastomosis, but that's the way we treat the pylorus. So we do Botox and dilation at the end of the operation. There's mm -hmm. another topic. I never do no. anything to the pylorus. Nothing. No, no. Neither do we. Never, but perhaps it's wrong. Yeah. And, right. I'm sorry, do you? No. No? We're just trying to establish an expert consensus about the late gastric conduit emptying to be able to study it, to define it, and to, to, to start studying it, because it's a, it's a big issue. Yeah, it's a very confusing yeah. and confused issue. Yeah, it is. It is. I, well, it has I, a lot to do with the size of the graft. I mean, the old studies with full gastric, you know, non-tubes, clearly the pyloroplasty was beneficial. showed reduced aspiration rates during recovery. It's much less of a question, I think, with a thin gastric tube, how much benefit there is. So I started doing these uh, routine endoscopy at the end of the case when I switched to the minimally invasive because I want to, you know, I was very nervous about the anastomosis, and so we'd submerge it and then insufflate to see if we had any bubbling. Um, so I've sort of continued to do that, but it's it's very rarely that helpful. But I recently we did a case and I wanted to assess the pylorus, and as I insufflated the tube and I tubularize, it. Flipped. And it didn't completely flip, but it was enough to cause some distortion at, at the hiatus. And I thought, that's my gastric emptying problem. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's the pylorus. No, some redundance just above the pylorus and it becomes kind of yeah. uh, J-shaped. If you don't stretch it enough, you, you do the anastomosis and you, you want you, you don't want a problem with it getting too too short or tight, so you have some extra length. And then when it's finished and it fills up, it kind of hangs. Mm -hmm. That can be one of the main reasons. And what was your solution? Well, I, I, I uh, obviously evacuated the air, but then we uh, grasped it underneath and, re and reoriented it so that it was straight. And then I didn't put any more air in. Yeah. And I was hoping that by the time we fed the patient, it would be fixed. <laughs> but uh, did the patient cooperate with that? <laughs> that one did. <laughs> that one did. But I, I think that that might be uh, some of the trouble afterwards. And which brings me to the NG tubes. In what way does it bring you to the NG tubes? Well, do you use an NG tube? Well, I'm in a transition phase right now. Mm -hmm. So we typically used NG tubes until we saw some activity. And then after hearing from Dr. Lee in China that he never uses them, mm -hmm. I, I put it in for overnight, and I'd get an x-ray in the morning to see if there was distension or not, and what the output was. And if there was no distension, the output was moderate, then we took the tube out and started liquids the same, the post-operative anymore. And, and what's moderate output? Oh, no, less than 500. Oh, okay. This is with the That's laparoscopic or open transdominal operations, or both? Um, Would you switch it up? No, it doesn't matter. And now, uh, well, as to if I did, I didn't put it in a G2. We start feeding the people stuff day one. Right. And not feeding. Clear liquid. Clear liquid. This is an important issue. I mean, we, we would really need a trial just testing uh, the, the nasogastric tube, and we don't have that. We have a lot of you know, observational data. There is one trial, however, from the Netherlands. We participated from Stockholm. The Nutrient 2, two trial just finished and soon being submitted, comparing uh, early feeding without a nasogastric tube. The patient could start feeding liquids from post-op day one compared to having a nasogastric tube conventionally for three to four days. And, uh, well, you'll see the results, but there was major generally no difference in leaks or anything. Well, it's not a leak that it leaks. Or aspiration. Aspiration. You know? aspiration. Well, some people worry about leaks. Yeah. Aspiration is a real concern. Yeah. And, you know, these big, but and when, they, when you're done with an esophagectomy, an aspiration is a big... It's a big problem. Sure, yeah. How narrow do you make your tube? Um, ours is about five centimeters. Uh -huh. So not super narrow. Five to six centimeters. Yeah. 
So I, I tried the, I tried the NoNG tube for a little bit, and then I had one of these distended conduits, and I thought, oh, I should go back to putting the NG tube in. So then I'm, I'm back to putting the NG tube in. But I've found, for me, the NG doesn't necessarily prevent the distension. No. And you Botox everybody. We've started to do that. I, I've been in many phases. No treatment, hyaluroplasty, Botox, uh, stretching. There's no consistent results from my perspective. As soon as you have something bad go on and you change your approach. Yeah. It's very unscientific, but more satisfying. Very surgical, very typical behavior. <laughs> I'm interested in people's opinions or how they manage one of what I think is an upcoming major complication of human invasive fibroblast esophagectomies, and that's paraconduit hernias. Yeah, and big how problem. do we prevent those because they're becoming very important. Yeah. Uh, it's a difficult problem. I don't have any solutions. No. <laughs> I've seen them. Yeah, more frequently yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, really an exception in the yeah, open surgery. Well, the report suggests about a 20% incidence. Yeah, 15 so. to 20 maybe. Yeah. And we've had not dissimilar number. Fortunately, none, well, I shouldn't say none. We've had two that have required urgent surgery. One in the post-operative phase in the hospital. And another came back uh, several years later with an urgent uh, obstructing uh, hernia. But radiographically, we see more than those, many more than those. There's no symptoms whatsoever right. in the majority of people. Yeah, the natural history is not well defined, though. But clearly, there are the patients. I had a patient back from the coast of Portugal who's called one. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. Clearly, it's not completely benign. No, no, no. No, we don't know the frequency of that. It's good. But prevention is the real prevention is hard. I think if question. you have a big hiatal hernia, you've got to narrow the hiatus. Sure. And there are people that do not do a, 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 a coca maneuver uh, in general if you're doing a minimum base of arborless. And sometimes I'll put a stitch at the base of the coral V to also shrink the hands mm. a little bit. But it's just compromised because you don't want it so tight that you're struggling to pull your No, no, no. Yeah. But do you normally tack your conduit to the hiatus? If I'm doing uh, thoracoscopic, laparoscopic, and in the abdomen last, absolutely. I close the hiatus fairly tight, tack the graft along the left cruise, and then usually one or two stitches mm. to the right cruise. What we started to do is put stitches uh, from the abdomen but don't tie, not tying them, and, and, and then pushing the, the threads up hmm. on the thoracic side, and then we tie them uh, from These the thoracic the side. Of the curve? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we do that in, in large curves. Well, you know, we suture at the end uh, the conduit to the hiatus, but we've Did not tried to. No, we're oh, from we're the chest. From the chest yeah. side. And, and, and it's possible to tie, if you have the long threads, we use long threads and we tie them extracorporally then, mm -hmm. and that works really well. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but to place those stitches in the prone on the, uh, on the, on the opposite side is very difficult. So you pull the graft all the way and get stitches over to the left cruise? We just put in a few, it's just not circumferential. Okay. You, did you, any experience of that helping or it's too early to say? It's comforting. <laughs> yeah. So it helps you sleep. <laughs> Yeah. I did a few where I was at doing the laparoscopic phase. Um, we do quite a fair bit of uh, dissection in the mediastinum from the laparoscopic side. And with the left pleura open, I would um, put my conduit up into, into the left chest and then close the cura onto the conduit from the belly and then go to the, go to the chest. Um, but it does... If, if it's all in the left chest, everything is tucked down out of your way, which complicates things. And if it's in the right chest, it's complicated because now it's all in your way. So I sort of abandoned that. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But I think I, was I might... going to say it was brilliant. <laughs> Not really. But uh, I think I'm going to try and close the left side because they're almost always left-sided, yeah. though I've had one yeah. right-sided one. Yeah. And if you put in your stitches from the abdomen and you tie them only during your thoracic phase yeah. in prone position, yeah. do you have a good view? You're not afraid that some tissue is... Yeah. No, you have, you have a good view. You can, you can quite easily you know, push the conduit so you see the crew well. 
but it will be very difficult to place the stitch as well right. with a conduit yeah. in the way. So I think that works pretty well. Well, I have uh, one. We have like 30 seconds left. So I'm going to ask you each your preferred technique for anastomosis, and you can have at most a three word answer. Neck hand sewn, chest statement. Linear uh, surgeon. That was like six words. Yeah, well, I'm a bad counter. I'm a surgeon. Linear side to side is what we do uh, always in the chest and very often in the neck too. Circular. Staple. Stapled. Same in the chest, but in the neck, as well. The least technique. I'm uh, linear and uh, either staple or so the defect. Well, so we have a lot of varied experience. Uh, I think this has been a great discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks.